Welcome back to another episode of the Outdoor Adventures podcast here on Brownfield. I'm Brent Barnett, and we're talking fishing today. Joining us now on the show is Spencer Bauer with River Certified. Spencer, how are you doing today, man? Well, like we were talking about, I'm, I'm going to go fishing here shortly, so I'm pretty good. Yeah, I can't beat that. What's the season been like for you so far? Here we are as we talk in mid-April. Have you been catching a lot of fish up to this point? Yeah, it's, it's all perspective. Uh, like the fishing trips I've been going on have been pretty fun and catching some fish. And I've been dabbling in tournaments a little bit. And comparison is the robber of all joy. So if you don't finish above everybody else, you don't feel quite as good about it. But been catching some fish and peeling back some layers on new fisheries. And hopefully I won't suck as bad in the future. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> Are you focusing on lakes or rivers? What 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 are you looking at right now? Um, river systems that uh, are a combination of a bunch of different reservoirs. That's pretty common down in Alabama and then a lot of those southern fisheries where you just have a river and then just a chain of dams where they build reservoirs. So you have a bunch of different sections. You got river sections, you got reservoir sections, and then you got sections where they kind of transition and that's that's been the hang up, like trying to find fish is wh- where are they at based on the time of year and water conditions and stumble across a few, but not always the big ones you need. Can you talk with the listeners uh, about your story? Um, you know, where you grew up, how you got started fishing as a kid and um, how that has transpired into what you do now with River Certified. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot like a lot of people who enjoy fishing. You you start off and your dad or, or, or grandpa takes you to some farm ponds and uh, you realize that you really, really enjoy it real quick and you want to keep doing it. And, you know, you get a bike, then you get a, a vehicle and the, your wheels expand your range and how often you get to go. And I, I grew up in Southern Iowa, which is farm pond country and a lot of little dinky creeks or not a lot, but a few. And uh, so I caught, you know, bluegills and and largemouth and the occasional catfish and i knew catfish got big bigger than anything else i'd been catching so i wanted to catch those and they fought harder and then one the day that i did get uh my first bike and got the green light to go fish the the creek that was kind of the you know the the upper echelon of fisheries in my area so i got to go down and fish the creek by myself and chase cats around and that's where I grew up fishing in high school and then went to college and got busy with sports, but kept fishing anyway. You know, like it's, I've been pretty steady on the water my whole life, but the last few years, um, I was a teacher for a while or actually like eight years, junior high, uh, junior high science. And then I've been full-time, uh, fishing guide and social media stuff for the past three years. And, fish more now than I ever have. What about the, the content you put out on your, your YouTube channel? Um, what's kind of the, the mission of your channel and some of the work that you do there? Oh, when you say words like mission and goals, you're thinking going way <laughs> deeper than anything. I, I really think about like, I just try to do the stuff that I enjoy and hopefully uh, me enjoying it comes out on the video and people therefore enjoy watching the videos and, uh, videos, I, I mean, long form stuff, it'd be more like YouTube. I did a podcast for a while and really enjoyed it. It didn't get a whole lot of traction. So I backed off on that and started, you know, spending time in other areas, but, uh, do some more short form videos on like Facebook. That's something I'm working at. I want to start doing like tips, you know, daily tips on live videos. Uh, I've done a few, but, um, uh, that's that's something I'm going to dive in and be try to be more consistent at starting as soon as we get off of this this uh, discussion. I'm going to head outside and do a little tip video for any cat fishermen out there. But I fish for a lot of catfish. I'd say most of what I'm doing is trying to catch big cats and uh, I do a lot of channel catfishing. I really enjoy channel catfishing. A lot of the trophy cat guys they kind of snub their nose at the lowly channel cat, but I love them. You know, you catch them on appropriate size tackle and that's a blast. And I do quite a bit of walleye fishing and wiper fishing and 
just kind of try to take advantages of the seasonal fishing opportunities that you get wherever you're at. You know, every year you see these pictures on social media, on Instagram of people that reel in these giant catfish, I don't know, 70, 80 pounds plus, you know, and they're like holding them up barely of both arms. I think the biggest catfish I've ever caught in my life, Spencer, was eight or nine pounds. And that was in a farm pond back when I was a little kid. Uh, always did a lot of bass fishing growing up. But um, can you describe to the listeners hooking on to a listen, an extremely large catfish, what that feels like and just the power that they have? Well, to revisit what you just said, the best way to catch big catfish is to fish for big catfish. So I'm assuming you don't target them very much. Uh, That's true. That's true. Even if you do target them, they're they're tough to to catch on a consistent basis at times. I mean, there are times where uh, it can seem like there's an unlimited supply of big catfish in, in the lake or river, but Usually those are special circumstances. And, but uh, as far as tying into them, a lot of it just depends on the type of catfish. Like a blue catfish, they don't really nibble. Even the even the, the smaller 10 to 20 pound, which for a blue cats, that is a little bit smaller. It's 10 to 20 pound fish and they're fun. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, that's, that's crazy that that's your smaller fish. But when they, they don't nibble much unless they're really, really inactive, but they'll hit a, a rod and just completely demolish it. Like if you're bank fishing, you better have it tightly secured to something or have it in free spool clicker. Um, if you have it in free spool clicker, they're going to take off screaming a million miles an hour. And as soon as you come tied on them, lots of times, as soon as they feel that pressure, they're going to run right back at you until either their belly scrape in the bottom and they realize they're going the wrong direction. If you're bank fishing, or they get right under the boat and that's where most of the battles at. And, uh, they're just heavy, a lot of weight. They're not going to go on at least on big cat tackle. They're not going to bust off like a hundred yard run, like a tarpon or, or something like that, or a big red fish would, but it's just power and, and, and endurance, you know, like these, uh, even with a lot of drag on them, the fights can, I mean, it's a tug of war for, 30 seconds to two minutes, depending on how big a fish you're, you're hooked onto. And this is with 80 pound braid, mainline heavier action rods and 80 pound leader. I mean, and I'm putting a lot of heat on those fish. And, and then with the flatheads, they, they'll fool you. Like the blues sometimes, or lots of times they'll hit it and you think you have a bigger fish hit the, the bait than it actually is. Whereas the flatheads, I mean, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a two pounder and a 52 pounder. Like they kind of just grab the the bait and your rod tip will just bob. Or if you have it in free spool clicker, it'll just steadily start to roll. Just And then once you hook up, it's generally a fight from beginning to end. They'll throw big head shakes at you and make, make that rod, you know, bellow up and down, throw that rod butt right in your stomach and, I mean, you better have a good grip on the fishing rod. They're not tuna, you know, they're, they don't have that explosiveness, but just sheer power and durability. And, and then I guess some explosiveness and short bursts. And I don't know, like catfishing is a lot of boredom followed up by a few minutes of absolute pandemonium and chaos. Was it interesting throughout your life, kind of learning those behavioral traits with each species of catfish and kind of like you explained there with uh, not really knowing with a flathead how they can fool you? I mean, it's just things that, that if you're on the water and fish form a bunch, you kind of pick up on. I try my best to pick up on patterns. Um, I think patterns are a way to stay on a fish or to catch fish more consistently than fishing just a spot or looking for um, spots. I mean, certain spots are good at certain times and they're not at other times. So the better you understand that, the more consistent you can catch the fish. Um, sounds simple, but it's not always so simple, but it's sure it's fun, you know, and noticing how they bite is just kind of a pattern. They'll, they'll fool you too, though. Like blues will hit, they'll hit it and run sideways sometimes. And you think you got a flathead and, uh, sometimes a flathead will KO a fishing rod and, make the drag sizzle and the rod holder you just never know 100 percent. but there's def definitely trends and, and things that kind of play out you know as we kind of get close to the summer can you maybe 
talk for our listeners about uh, the Midwest. You know, let's just, you know, I'm located in Iowa. You talked about your Iowa background. Uh, just maybe some tips for them on how to locate, try to locate, you know, big catfish and different types of, I guess, uh, streams to look at um, areas, maybe, um, I don't know if I want to say habitat or just features in the water they should target or things like that. Well, one of my favorite things about the Midwest and I'm down South now running trips, but I'll be back in a couple of weeks and I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, the, the Midwest is super diverse. You have a lot of smaller streams that support wonderful channel cat populations and some big flatheads. And then you also have the Mississippi and you have the Missouri, and then you have a bunch of reservoirs sprinkled in there. Um, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, like all those states. I mean, Wisconsin, I mean, Southern Minnesota, South Dakota. I mean, just the list goes on of every one of them states has excellent fishing opportunities in a variety of, and you can catch fish in a variety of different ways. And that's like my favorite part about the Midwest, the, the thing I, I don't care for much is the cold, which is why I'm down south right now and had been. But um, those small streams are probably your your simplest, most straightforward place to to find to try to get on fish consistently. Um, but it, a lot of it just depends on what type of fishing you want to do and what how big of a catfish and how you want to catch them. Um, there's opportunities in all of it, but. I'd say the foundation of most of my knowledge that I have for catfish started within fishermen. And if you're wanting to get into catfishing, uh, there's a book called Channel Catfish Fever that In Fisherman put out. Um, I think it was authored by Doug Stange, uh, Steve Quinn, and Otis Smith, who in my mind are legends in fishing, not just catfishing, um, but just fishing in general. And they cover how to consistently find and locate catfish in small streams. And I mean, that book is responsible for, I don't know what percentage of the catfish I've caught in my life, but definitely well over 50% of them. I'm curious, Spencer, we've had, you know, really going on three straight years now of drought across the, the Midwest. Has that impacted your fishing at all uh, along the river systems here in the Midwest with the extreme drought conditions we've been seeing? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, water levels are going to impact everything like high water changes, what the fish do, low water changes, what the fish do. Uh, my concern with the drought is just reduction of habitat. You know, the, the, the lower the water, the less habitat available, the more consolidated fish are, um, the more consolidated the bait is, but um, with that less habitat and less diverse habitat, it's got to be hard on populations. Uh, I don't know what type of um, what how it actually impacts the populations, but all I know is the fishing has been progressively more difficult every year. And, and maybe it's just I haven't figured out how to get them during extended drought. I mean, it's, it's weird when you have a hundred year drought for like three years in a row. So is that a 300 year drought span or is that like, or is it exponential where it's a one in every 3000 year event? I don't know, but it, it's made fishing, especially in those smaller rivers, more difficult. And maybe those fish get out of there. Maybe they sense that drought and a, a large percentage of them went down to the, the main body of water it dumps into. I, I'm not sure. I just, I just know drought has made things more difficult. You think it would consolidate the fish and make it easier in the first year of low water, it seemed to, but it's just got progressively more difficult. So I've had to change up how I do things quite a bit. And not that I've completely abandoned those small streams, but I haven't spent as much time on them as I, I had in years prior, just because they haven't been as productive. Spencer, as we wind down here on our show this week, can you just maybe tell the listeners how they can find your videos online and uh, what you're expecting to have come up. Uh, just Google river certified and um, all my stuff will pop up Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, I do a little bit of TikTok. I've been slacking on that, uh, but I might, I, I kind of, I'm going to start doing some more lives. And like I said, I'm going to start doing more tips and tricks videos, like little, little things that will make your fishing trip a little more efficient. Nothing extravagant but maybe like gizmos here and there and or things i do to keep it simple because i'm not i don't 
I don't like to bring in any more than I have to. And I like things that are going to, you know, simple things or tricks that just make fishing more enjoyable. And when you spend a pile of time on the water, you start to notice those things. And it's just fun little stuff I can share with everybody. Um, so stuff like that. But I, I put out a video on YouTube every Monday, Thursday at 4 p.m. Central. So I just posted one yesterday and I'll have another one Thursday. Spencer, we'll have to have you back on the show sometime soon. I'm excited to learn more. Uh, thanks for coming on for a quick conversation on our show this week. Well, I appreciate the invitation, man. Like it's pretty flattering when somebody asks you to hop on something like this and you guys do a great job. And so that makes it even more exciting on my own. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks again. And hope you have a, a good time on your fishing today. Thanks, man. Again, that's Spencer Bauer with River Certified. Be sure to check him out online. And thanks a lot for watching our episode of Outdoor Adventures this week, right here on Brownfield Ag News.